There's an altercation being waged that doesn't have a definitive answer. It's not a traditional debate in a courtroom where two sides gather and lay out their evidence to be dismantled by the opposing side. It's a clash of opinions within the comment sections, subreddits, and blog opinions online. One of the most hotly contested debates in the camera space, which sensor is better? Full frame or APS-C? <coughs> I see the real choice being sensor size. The real question photographers should be asking is full frame or APS-C. Or better stated, which sensor is preferable? I dove into the archives, researched the literature, and investigated both sides of the argument, and put both sensors to the test under the macro lens. I explored, experimented, and analyzed real-world shooting environments with both sensors, and put this unbiased fact-finding video together for you. We will look at the side-by-side -side image comparisons, do some low-light tests, dynamic range, talk about lens choices, focal length, aperture, crop factors, and jump into the history and the future of both full frame and APS-C so you can form your own opinion on this sensor's age-old argument. You may be asking, why is this important? Well, my hierarchy flow is story, production, design, production value, editing, and gear and workflow is research, ideation, scripting, B-roll, and execution. And in that order, out of that order, we'll develop a thin yet clunky set of sparse information that will satisfy my ADD and send my OCD into a tailspin. Knowing which sensor is best for you is important so you're intentional with your shots and in complete control of your frame. This way your camera is appropriately chosen as the foundation for telling your story. Once upon a time, a long time If you stick ago. around to the end, I'll let you know a hack that I believe will be the answer for those of you who just don't know which camera to go with. Once we set the record straight, you and I will soar like eagles today on the FA. If you're this far down the rabbit hole with all this camera stuff, then you're on the right track. In fact, I actually asked this exact question a few years ago. So what's the big difference between APS-C and full frame? And all I got were people's opinions. So to keep this as unbiased and objective as possible, let's talk about the CMOS sensor. When you hit a silicon atom with a photon flux or light, it releases an electron, creating a balance between the photon flux and the electron flux. So when you hit silicon with light, it generates electrons. And then if you convert those into voltage and you can read them out, then you have a camera sensor. The sensors we use in our Sony cameras and smartphones are CMOS sensors compared to CCD sensors which are more expensive to manufacture but produce less noise. Anyone who uses a modern smartphone with a camera, a modern DSLR camera, dental x-ray systems, automotive safety systems, can thank NASA for the CMOS sensor we use today, along with a man named Eric Fossum. Mr. Fossum was a professor at Columbia University and was recruited to the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology, Caltech. NASA wanted to make smaller rockets and smaller instrument systems and tasked Mr. Fossum with figuring it out. He quickly realized he needed to build smaller cameras from a bread box size to the size of a coffee cup or even smaller. After he developed the sensor, it was the smartphone that made them stick. Today, over 6 billion cameras are manufactured each year using CMOS technology. So now we understand where the sensor came from and we have a base of how it was developed. The main difference between full frame cameras and APS-C cameras is the actual size of the sensor. Full frame sensors are larger at 35 millimeters at their longest edge and the typical APS-C APS-C sensor size is different across camera brands. APS-C sensors on a Sony, Fuji, Nikon, Pentax, and others are 23.6 millimeters and 22.3 millimeters on a Canon at its longest edge. All of the differences flow from there. As a side note, a sensor that's even bigger than a full frame is medium format, and I'd love to get my hands on one of those cameras to test it out. It's just not in my budget this year. There's also a sensor size smaller than APS-C, which is micro four thirds, created by Olympus and Panasonic, measuring 17 millimeters along Long, its longest edge. And there's also a one inch sensor. And there's a one inch sensor in my favorite point and shoot camera, the ZV-1. Don't forget about the crop factor when choosing your camera. The smaller sensor size on the APS-C compared to full frame gives a more narrow field of view, which is where the 1.5 times crop factor on Sony cameras and 1.6 times crop factor comes from on the Canon cameras. This makes APS-C cameras less desirable for 
wider shots. When I say crop factor, I'm talking about multiplying the actual focal length and aperture of whatever lens you're using by 1.5 or 1.6, depending on what camera you're using. So in other words, this 50 millimeter F1.8 turns into a 75 millimeter F2.5 on an APS-C camera. By the way, you can use full frame lenses on APS-C cameras, but you can't use APS-C lenses on full frame cameras unless you have a crop mode on your camera like the a7 IV. But just because full frame sensors are larger doesn't make them better, so to speak. For for example, APS-C sensors are smaller, which means APS-C cameras are more likely to be more compact, lighter, and cheaper. This is better for travel content creators, vloggers, and street and wildlife photography. And since a smaller area is required from the lens point of view, the lens can be smaller, lighter, and therefore more affordable. But hold up for a second, don't go running off and picking up an APS-C camera. Full frame has its benefits, which may outweigh the APS-C camera system. Because a full frame sensor has a wider field of view, a full frame camera is ideal for wide angle landscapes and real estate interiors and astrophotography. As a general rule, especially at wider apertures, lower F numbers, full frame cameras can produce a narrower depth of field than APS-C cameras, meaning you can get more of a blurry background. If you are into portraits or still life photography or any situation where you wanna have a blurry background to put focus on the subject in the foreground, then full frame is the way to go. Also, if you remember earlier how we talked about the light gathering capabilities of the sensor and full frame cameras, then you'll remember that the light receptors on a full frame image sensor will be larger than those of an APS-C camera. The low light capabilities of both sensors is an important factor. Full frame has more light gathering potential, which will capture more information with less image noise, especially at high ISO settings in low light conditions. That makes full frame cameras better candidates for low light shooting, weddings, indoor, and during evening hours. When I'm shooting video on my APS-C FX30, my base ISO is 800 or 2500, whereas my A7S III's base or native ISO is 640 to 12,800. This is the ISO in which the sensor works the best and gives the cleanest image. That's also when I shoot an S-Log3. Now, some have called full-frame cameras more of a professional choice than APS-C cameras because of their ability to gather more light. However, you can get a further reach with the crop on an APS-C camera, 1.5 on Sony, 1.6 on Canon, which makes the APS-C more desirable if you're shooting with telephoto lenses for wildlife or sports photography. We shot an entire nature documentary with the Sony ZV-E10, which is an APS-C camera. And instead of being maxed out on the telephoto lens, which we were using, this one, which is 210 millimeters, we were able to get a whopping 315 millimeters because of that 1.5 times crop. By the way, that APS-C lens that we used on that documentary is this one, the Sony 55, the 210 millimeter lens. We got it for 298 bucks, brand new on Amazon. And I've seen it down to 189 bucks used. If we were to purchase a similar full frame telephoto lens that delivers approximately the same focal length, we'd be looking at over $1,200 US new and $750 used. That's a huge price gap between APS-C lenses and full frame, which brings up the next topic of discussion. That price gap is pretty common with both full frame lenses and APS-C lenses across the entire spectrum. Full frame lenses are gonna cost double, sometimes triple of what an APS-C lens will cost, unless you go with like a kit lens. You can buy two and sometimes three lenses for your APS-C camera compared to buying one full frame lens for your full frame camera, which makes the APS-C camera a more budget friendly camera, especially for beginners or people on a budget. Before we get into all that, I'd like to thank Hohem for sponsoring this video. If you remember, I made a video about two years ago about how to film yourself. That was before this technology was available. If I had this then, I would have just said buy this because it'll save you from having to use a rope attached to a tripod. With the iSETI M6, you can set it up on a tripod iPod with your phone and gesture okay to start tracking so it will follow you as you walk and talk to the camera. This is great for those of you who need a cameraman but just don't have one. The fact that it follows you brings a higher level of production to your videos instead of just having the phone camera stand on a tripod still and boring. 
It has a magnetic fill light with a built-in vision sensor tracking, which easily attaches and detaches magnetically. You don't need to connect to an app, just to track. And when you're done with tracking, you just hold up your hand and it stops. It has an upgraded anti-shake system, a low angle and quick to switch wide angle shooting modes, and a quick switch to portrait mode. Warm, cold, and RGB fill light. If you're someone who shoots by themselves, then this is your gimbal. I'll leave a link in the description. Now let's get back to the video. So far we've touched on the pros and cons of full frame and a APS-C cameras. Full frame cameras are generally heavier, bigger, and more expensive and require a bigger budget for lenses, but the detail you will get will be better for low light performance and dynamic range. APS-C are generally less heavy, smaller, less expensive, and require a smaller budget. Due to these facts, we now have another issue that we have to discuss in this modern era. Uh, let's stop for a second and do some real talk. My ACAM is the A7S III with the 35mm f1.4 Zeiss lens, and my B-cam is the FX30 with the 7 Artisans 35mm T, T1, 25? 25 millimeter T 1.05. The script that I wrote for this video took about eight hours over the course of three days and probably three hours worth of research. So it's not like I just turned on the camera and started recording. It took an extensive amount of research to figure out all of this content because a lot of it I didn't even know. All right, back to the video. Because APS-C cameras are cheaper to manufacture and they make a lot more than they do with full frame, and there's a higher demand, then we might see supply chain issues more with APS-C cameras and their lenses than we do with full frame. I see this on my channel a lot. I hear a lot of people say they can't purchase a certain APS-C camera or lens that they want because it's back ordered. I also know if you were to start a YouTube channel about different cameras, I would say make your videos about APS-C cameras like the ZV-E10 rather than a camera like the A7S III simply because it's a cheaper camera, which means there's going to be a bigger crowd who will purchase it. But I don't want this video to be about what cameras better to review or grow an audience with. The real question is what camera is better for your needs? We started this video off with the question, which sensor is better? But really the question should be, what sensor is better for you and your needs? Ask yourself, what are you shooting? Are you a hobbyist who likes to take photos on the weekend and would like a few different lenses to choose from? Then APS-C may be your preferred camera. Are you an aspiring video creator or photographer and want to create a living making videos and shooting photos? Then maybe the full frame is the way to go. The last thing that you want to happen if you get home from say your first wedding shoot and you see that there's a bunch of noise in the image because you were shooting low light and you had an APS-C camera and the lens that you were using didn't have a wide enough aperture. And then there's very few options that you can do at that point in time to get rid of the noise. Whereas if you're using a full frame in a low light situation, you would have way better results. You can always purchase speed boosters to use full frame lenses on APS-C cameras, which allows you to reduce the size of an image created by the lens. But to me, that's just more money and more gear that you have to make sure to pack. My hack for the problem of trying to figure out which one of these two sensors is better for you is to purchase a camera like the Sony a7 IV or the Canon R3 and shoot in crop mode, which works with different types of APS-C lenses. That way you can purchase APS-C lenses until you can afford full frame lenses. Crop mode won't use the entire full frame sensor, but it's slices an APS-C crop out of it and you lose a ton of megapixel. I used an APS-C anamorphic lens with the a7 IV and it worked flawlessly. I know some people argue not to do this mainly due to not using all the sensor, but it's a good workaround and what I would do if I was starting all over, especially if you're on a budget. I believe the future points to bigger sensor sizes, which means APS-C might be not time capsulated, whatever that means. So I'm setting up two different cameras, an APS-C camera and a full frame camera and I have similar focal length lenses on both of them so that we can get a good idea of what the crop factor looks like. So the first step in this process is I wanna make sure that both cameras are exposed exactly the same. Even though this is a full frame camera and this is an APS-C camera, this is gonna give you more dynamic range, which means the highlights won't be so blown out, but we'll still get a good idea of what the actual frame looks like when you compare that crop factor. To touch a little bit more on that crop factor, we have two very similar focal lengths on both of these lenses on a full frame camera and on an APS-C camera. We have the Tamron 17 to 28 millimeter F2.8 on the A7S III, and we have it set to 20 millimeters. This is a full frame camera. And we have our Viltrox 13 millimeter F1.4 uh, set up on our APS-C ZV-E10. I actually have the aperture set to 2.8 on this lens so it can match the 2.8 on that lens. So we 
have very similar lengths. When we add that 1.5 times crop to the Viltrox 13 millimeter, it actually turns this focal length into 20 millimeters. That's how we know we have a similar look. So I'm gonna press record on both of these cameras. I have the active stabilization off inside of the ZV-E10, which gives it a fairly big size crop, normally 35%. And I have the steady shot off on the A7 III. Did I say A7S III before? It's the A7 III, it doesn't matter, it's a full frame. This is all about the frame right now. We don't care about the dynamic range. So now we're gonna go into post and I'm gonna put both frames side by side so you can see what a 1.5 times crop looks like on an APS-C camera. We saw a snake. So now we're gonna see if we can get it. I cannot believe you saw that. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if I missed anything and what you like better. Until the next one, peace.